Hello everyone and welcome to 7EDU's open class. 7EDU's goal is to provide quality test prep to students and unlock their unique potentials. We are a team of experts and strategies that have helped students not only in the Bay Area, but also around the world achieve the perfect standardized test scores. Not only does 7EDU personalize the learning experience to each individual learner, but we also help develop academic confidence and success. In today's open class, um, we will be focusing on the reading edition of our proven SAT strategies to raise scores. We will be going through SAT reading strategies with our instructor, Amy, and answer real questions from our students and parents. Stick to the end of our open class because mm -hmm. there's a secret bonus that is waiting for you. So for a brief um, intro to our instructor, we have Amy speaking. Amy has teaching experience with various research institutions and has taught extensively on the SAT reading, writing, and essay sections. Her students have improved their SAT reading and writing scores by over 100 points. With her tips and essay strategies, Amy will help you academically succeed. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share right now and hand it over to Amy so she can go ahead and begin her lecture for all of you. Okay. Hello all, my name is Amy. So I will be going through some strategies for the SAT reading today. Okay, so let me get this PowerPoint started. So the first question that we all ask is what does the SAT reading test? Reading comprehension or argument comprehension? So it's a common misconception that the SAT reading test, what we call reading comprehension, or the ability to simply pick out details from the text or summarize a text. And while it's true that you do need some of that, the SAT is actually more accurately what we call an argument comprehension test. So what's the difference? Comprehending an argument is not only understanding a summary, right? Or the details is knowing how the uh, argument is constructed, what the main point of a passage is, and how paragraphs and lines are interrelated, okay? So it's a little what we call rhetorical reading. So what kind of questions are on the SAT reading? Well, we have them divided up here. So I won't have the time to go over all of these today. We're just going to go over the big picture questions. Uh, but to summarize, they're the big picture, our main idea questions, literal comprehension, or the ability to restate the same idea in different terms, inference questions, which uh, rely on logical reasoning, et cetera, supporting evidence, so understanding how to choose the correct lines to support an argument, function or purpose. These questions are more abstract, or they test you on what the purpose of a line within the passage is. Vocabulary and context. This is knowing how to define terms on the SAT based on the context of the passage. A rhetorical strategy and passage organization is a uh, very rarely shows up. It's really just analogy questions, knowing how lines function with each other, tone and attitude, so author's tone and attitude, supporting and undermining claims. So this is a subset of the evidence questions. Analogy, so also a very rare question type that mainly be able to compare a situation, a passage with an abstract situation that's posed in the answer choices. The paired passage, which always shows up on the SAT, is knowing the relationship between different passages. And then lastly, what we call the information graphic. So this is just knowing how to interpret graphs, charts, etc. Okay, so here is a breakdown of the question types. Uh, okay, so I think some of this got cut off, but mostly is the majority of it is, I believe, uh, big picture questions, evidence questions, which are the new question type and purpose questions. So you'll notice that a lot of these questions that the SAT focuses on is not actually on being able to pick up small details. Like I would say the ACT is more focused on that. The SAT is very focused on comprehending the uh, rhetorical structure of a passage. So once again, 
how the argument is constructed, how the author builds a convincing argument and tries to persuade the reader. Okay, I guess an exception you would say maybe is the literature passage, which we will also go over today. But even that, I think it's not uh, reading for specific details per se, so much as understanding an overarching theme. Okay. Okay, so to some, the SAT tests what we call rhetorical reading. It's active reading that knows how an argument is being made. The test should be managed as a whole and not in chunks. Okay, part of the key to doing well on the SAT is understanding that uh, as a test, it is trying to uh, accomplish certain things. So within the answer choices themselves, the answers have been deliberately written in a way to catch students that make common errors. So what answer choices are incorrect? Well, they're either answer choices that are completely off topic, so irrelevant, not pertinent to what the main point is, too broad. So an answer choice that is simply uh, too broad makes too large of a claim that cannot be supported by a passage, which may be more on something more specific. Too extreme. So these are answer choices that will contain modifiers like all and only. Very rarely will a passage claim that their argument is the only solution or that their argument uh, is, applies to all situations. Half right, half wrong. These are very common uh, wrong answers on the SAT. So for a careless test taker, they'll read half of the answer, realize only look at the part that's correct and miss the other half, which is an incorrect statement of something within the passage and choose it. For an answer to be correct, it must be 100% correct. Could be true, but not enough information. So this is what we call speculation. Um, it's a common error that people make when they read. You want to speculate, but once again, when it's testing you on reading comprehension, it's not asking you for things that are you know, theoretically true. It's asking you for what is stated within the text. So true for the passage as a whole, but not for the specific lines in question. Uh, this is very relevant for what we call the function questions. So part of it is knowing what questions are asking for. If a question is asking you for the main purpose of a passage, then you want to give them the answer that is relevant for the passage. If the question is asking you for the function of a few lines, then you want to give them the answer choice that is the function of the line and not the passage. So the last one is factually true, but not stated in the passage. So a common trap answer on the SAT is just using something that is you know, universally known to be true, but it's not relevant or is not stated in the passage. And since you know, this isn't a test about what people know, commonly know is a test of, can you comprehend the argument of a passage? It will never be the correct choice. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so now we're going to focus on one question type on the SAT. So this is what we call the big picture question. Uh, big picture because it's not testing you on details. It's testing you on the overarching argument. And these questions test a reader's ability to determine what we call the central claim of a passage. So are there three steps to this that you want to do? First, you want to identify the topic. Second, you want to identify what the point of the passage is that is also tied to the topic. And third, you want to be able to distinguish between the main point and the primary purpose. Uh, so I'll go a little bit into three right now. So the main point is always an argument the passage is trying to make. The primary purpose is the goal or what the passage is attempting to achieve. Let's go to the next part. Okay, so what is the topic? The topic is the person, thing, or idea that is the primary subject or focus of the passage. It is always important to, at the very least, identify what the topic of a passage is. How do we determine what the topic is? Well, usually it's the word or phrase that appears most frequently throughout the passage. The thing is, it may not be uh, stated with the same words throughout, as we'll see in the example, right? So let's go look at this example. So this one is a passage about citrus greening, right? So it's highlighted in the passage all the different ways in which citrus greening is referred to, right? It's called citrus greening, 
plague, the bacterial disease, uh, Huanglong Bing, the disease, the disease greening, the greening tide and it. So by itself, the term citrus greening is only, uh, it only appears twice in the passage, right? But all these synonyms and all these pronouns that stand in for this topic are repeated throughout the passage. So that is a clear sign that this is what the passage is about. The focus is on citrus greening, a plague that is affecting the orange industry. Okay, so on the SAT, similarly, when you want to find the topic, you, you always want to ask yourself, what is this passage focused on? What is repeated throughout? It may not be one word that is repeated throughout. It may be the same concept being expressed with different terms. Okay, so then how do we determine the main point or argument of a passage? Well, it's really the topic plus so what? So in the previous example, the topic was citrus greening, right? The main point would then be, why is the author writing about citrus greening? Is the author trying to say citrus greening is something we don't have to worry about? Is the author trying to say citrus greening is a serious problem that we need to contend? So the main point is always the topic and what the author is arguing about the topic is never what we would call a statement of fact. It has to be an argument. So something that can be either proven or disproven slash arguable. So four big picture questions. There are a few points in the passage that we always want to look for the answer because passages, if they're structured a certain way or they have the correct organization, will always have the relevant information at certain places. One place we want to look is at the introduction. So you want to find the thesis statement where the author puts down, this is my argument. Another part is at the beginning of the second paragraph. Uh, and the last part is in the conclusion, because oftentimes a passage will restate their main point at the very end. So the author does not state the point directly, write it yourself. Okay, it's very important for all questions on the SAT, not just the big picture question that you know what the main point of the passage is. And understand there's a difference between describing content and pinpointing the overarching argument. Describing content would be something like, citrus greening is a disease, right? Citrus greening, the author then talks about citrus greening originating uh, in Florida. The author then says citrus greening causes X, Y, Z, right? That's describing, it's a summary. An overarching argument would be something, the author points out the devastating effects of citrus greening to argue we must now make more technological such, uh, I think it's scientific advances to solve this severe issue. So one is simply describing content. That's not what the SAT is looking for. And the other is actually looking at the argument. Okay, let's move on. So this is an example of where you can look for the point of the paragraph. Uh, it's been bolded what the topic sentence is because the way this paragraph is structured is that the main point is repeated at the end, okay? So it starts with the sentence. Sometimes it seems surprising that science functions at all. Gives an example, a paper, a research finding. This paper is not the main point of the paragraph. This paper is evidence to support what the purpose is. So let's read the last sentence. As Ionidas concluded more recently, many published research findings are false or exaggerated, and an estimated 85% of research resources are wasted. So what is the main point of this paragraph? Is it that uh, most published research findings are false and that a professor found this? No, once again, that's all details that is supporting what the topic sentence told you. The main point is that in the evidence of these flaws, and these uh, potential biases, it is surprising that science functions as, uh, you know, an endeavor at all. Okay. Okay, so that was our brief overview of the big picture questions. Uh, usually in our actual class, we'll go over some examples because I think, uh, I think doing questions, reading passages, applying the strategies are the best way to learn them. Uh, so now we're gonna move on to the different passage types on the SAT. We're only gonna cover one today and that's the literature passage. Okay, give me one second. Let me check this. Okay, so there are four different types of passages on the SAT. One is the literature passage. The second is the historical. 
The third is what we call natural science, and the fourth is sociological. Sometimes you'll have two science passages or two sociology passages. You'll always only get one literature passage, so fiction. So what are the source of these literature passages? Well, it's an excerpt of a story from a wide range of time periods. It could be modern, although I haven't really seen that many modern ones, or it could be, uh, you know, from the 1800s, etc. but they're all fictional stories. Okay, so there are, well, I would say two main types of literature passages. One is what we call a narrative passage, so that's plot-based. Uh, it's focused on an event. Uh, person A does this, then person A does that, then person B finds person A, X happens. So very focused on events happening because the events or what happens in the plot will tell you what the moral of the story is. Usually something surprising will happen or there is going to be some sort of action that is the climax of the story. But it's very, you know, as I said before, plot based. The second type of passage you will get is called the descriptive passage. So these focus on a thing instead. So it's not really plot based. The entire passage might just be, you know, person A reminisces about their time on an island or person A uh, thinks about her relationship with her mother. So it's very much, I guess you would say more intimate. It's not focused on action. It's not focused on events. It's usually focused on a person, place or a particular story detail and always starts and ends with describing the topic. The key to these passages usually is some sort of mental shift, some sort of shift either about a person, a place, or a thing. Or you'll have passages that are a combination of both. Um, oh, excuse me, I don't know why the audio just broke up. Excuse me one second. Okay, so that will just be, you'll have some plot, but in the comment, in the, sorry about that, my speakers are kind of wonky at times. Okay, so, in between the descriptive elements or the plot, you'll have relationships between characters. You'll have descriptions of places. The unique element of the literature passage that I think makes it more difficult for some students is that it relies on reading for implicit meaning or interpretation. So it's not like a science passage where they will tell you the findings of the experiment are this, right? It'll say it straight out. A literature passage will never say the theme of the story is this, right? You're meant to take this. You have to uh, interpret that for yourself based on either action or character. So how do we do that? Okay, so what do you focus on to find that? Well, for one, the characters, right? I don't think I've ever seen a literature passage that had no characters. That's a bit impossible indeed. So you wanna identify the characters. You wanna identify who the main character is and evaluate how the author describes them. How is the author trying to portray these characters? You want to evaluate the relationships between characters and their opinions of each other. Uh, does person A dislike person B, etc.? cetera? Uh, then you want to identify what we call the turning point of the story. Turning point is really just another term for climax. So that means usually it's when the character reaches a revelation, some event happens. The turning point is usually what the message of the story is. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so once again, the literature passage will test your skill as an analytical reader because questions will rely on the passage's implied meaning rather than stated message. All right, so what are some examples of what we call indirect characterization? Because very rarely in a story, will, uh, well, sometimes it'll happen, but very rarely will the author say, well, this person is lazy or this person is conflicted about X, Y, Z, this person is indecisive. They'll most likely use indirect things that you are meant to interpret the information from. So here are five things that you can focus on, on these passages. The first one is description. So physical description of the character or the setting. Second one is dialogue, what the character says, how he, she expresses himself. Uh, third is action. Right, if you have a character who is just sleeping all the time, then you can probably kind of infer from the action that he or she does is not a very uh, hardworking individual. Or, I, yeah, so internal speech slash monologue, the thoughts of the character, uh, responses, how others respond to the main character. Because oftentimes in literature passages, 
you're looking at relationships between characters, right? One character's comment is going to reflect on another. All right, let's move on. So these are a few examples of how uh, literature passage, the examples of the indirect characterization I talked about. I don't think we have the time to go over all of them, but usually uh, on the full class, we'll go through them. So I'm just going to go through the dialogue one, right? What can you infer from this dialogue? Sure, you matter to me, Roger said to his wife, yet it was the window and the image of himself the moonlight helps reflect back that Roger appeared to be seeking to. So here in the dialogue, you see an inherent conflict between what Roger says and what he is focusing on, right? He says his wife matters, but who is he speaking to? His reflection. He's not even looking at his wife at this point. So from this dialogue is a reasonable inference that Roger is self-absorbed. Nothing matters not nothing, but what matters most to Roger is Roger. Okay, so you can look a bit at the other examples. Okay, so now we're going to move to some common questions on the SAT reading. One, should I read every single line in detail for the SAT reading? Absolutely not. No, because not you know, contrary to what people think, not every single line has the same importance on whatever passage you read, be it historical or literature. The key to succeeding is knowing which lines are pertinent to the argument and which lines are just more, uh, well, just details that aren't completely necessary to understanding what the primary argument is. Okay, second. Do I need to have prior knowledge of science or history to do well on the SAT reading? Also, no, absolutely not. Some students will be a bit uh, daunted by, I think, the technical language in the science passages or some of the outdated language in the historical passages. The thing is, if any of this you know, technical language or old language was necessary to understand the point of the passage, the SAT will define it for you. If it doesn't define a technical term, the meaning is that you should be able to infer the gist of it and understand the main point of the paragraph uh, passage regardless. Okay, should I read the questions before I read the passage? We actually recommend no, because I, it's mostly what I would say a waste. You don't need to read the questions if you know how to actively read for an argument beforehand, if you know where to focus on a paragraph for the main argument. Okay, four, if I don't understand parts of the passage, what should I do? You just move on, all right? So a lot of students, you know, especially students that struggle with time on the SAT will tell me that, oh, I did not understand this part of the passage. So I read and reread it over and over again. Never ever do that. Because as we know from line one, not every single line is important. If you don't understand a part of it, keep on moving on, try to, still grasp what the main argument is. And oftentimes, once you understand the main argument, some of the details will become more clear, at least in a very broad way, how they fit into it. Okay. Uh, so I think that also answers number six, any advice on how to read faster. It's just really, I, I think students read slowly when they have the mistaken assumption they need to understand or memorize every single detail is really you do not need to understand every single detail to know what the common argument is. Uh, what are common traps that students fall into on the SAT reading? Well, no, I can't give all of them today, but really a common trap I see is that students will try to read too much into things. But what I mean by that is, you know, an answer sounds good or based on common knowledge, they think this is true. And so they'll choose the answer because it sounds right. But that is not what the SAT is testing on. The SAT is not testing on what common knowledge is, right? It's testing on what the passage actually states. So, you know, you never want to fall for that trap. Uh, are there any strategies on what questions to do first? I think that really varies from student to student. Uh, you know, honestly, I think you should just follow the order in the passage, unless there's a question that you find incredibly difficult, in which case you just just not waste too much time on it and move on. All right, 
So I think this ends the lecture part of today, and we're just going to open it up for a Q&A. And I'm going to turn it back to Kathy and see if she wants to add something right now. Yeah, thank you, Amy. So this is portion of the open class. We would like to um, have the students or parents ask questions. So to our audience that are currently watching right now, if you guys have any questions or things you want to clarify about the open class that Amy taught today, um, could you go ahead and place it into the chat box or maybe even add it to the Q&A box that we have? Um, we'll give you guys maybe one to two minutes. Um, if not, we'll go ahead and move on forward. You guys can also raise your hand on the Zoom if that works for you guys instead. Yeah, um, okay, well, I personally have a question as well. I know that the SAT test is tomorrow. Um, do you have any last minute tips you want to give to any of the students that are watching right now? Uh, I think if the SAT is tomorrow, mostly I tell students right now to not, I, I don't recommend very heavy last minute studying. Most mm -hmm. of our students are very disciplined. They've done the work already. Uh, but some tips is just most students have common errors they make on this test, common question types they miss. So the best thing really is review your errors ask yourself, why am I missing these questions? What common traps do I fall into? Review that so that you won't make the same mistake on test day. And other than that, just rest easy knowing, you know, if you've worked hard, then it's nothing to worry about. Yeah, very great tip. Thanks, Amy. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move on forward in the PowerPoint here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Yes, so Amy actually teaches one of or two of our upcoming December courses. So those would be the SAT 1500 plus and the ACT 35 plus all in one strategy courses. These are specialized classes that are taught in small group, um, small group classes. So each of our students receive maximum and focused attention from their instructors. Both of these classes have lectures with Q&A after each session a teacher assistant available for the students at all times, and a pre-test and post-class assessment that measures your academic improvement. Um, if your current SAT scores are around 1,300, we also offer a 1,400 plus option instead. And a little background more on the instructors besides Amy as well is um, Instructor June, um, our co-founder. She has helped students improve the SAT from 1,500 to 1,580 as well as the ACT from 33 to 36 in only 10 hours. Her experience goes over to 30,000 students and she has ensured full test marks for many of our student learners. And Amy, as you just have seen right now, is, has a strong academic background from UCLA as well as the University of Chicago. Dr. Yan is a tenured college professor, a former postdoc at Stanford and data scientist at, at Coursera. And of course, uh, we have Colin as well. And Colin has over 10 years of experience educating students at both the middle school and high school level. With Colin's expert credentials, students in his AP physics courses have achieved a passing rate that is double the national average. So for both of these courses, they will be upcoming for in December. The date is December 22nd to January 4th, 2020. And if you wanted to learn more about the courses, you can also give us a call at 408-216-9109, or you can scan the QR, card, the QR code that's in the bottom bar right there. And as we mentioned in our email, this is a lucky bonus for the viewers that actually stay to the very end. We have a secret $50 discount on your next 7EDU group class. If you send over the code 1206 to the WeChat account, um, we will offer the discount to you and this is only valid until the end of this month so be sure to get this discount before it's too late and if you are interested in any other test prep or academic guidance um, we also offer a free 30-minute consultation and our phone number again is 408-216-9109 and that will conclude our open class for today if no one has any questions if you do go ahead and put it into the chat box for us and we'll try to answer it as quickly as possible.
Thank you.